I'm, I'm sorry to say that I have none of Larry's artistic tendencies. And so I'm just going to present a, a regular talk without any kind of artistic stuff whatsoever. But language? your language is artistic, as we'll see. I, th I think sure Larry would agree. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a cognitive scientist. And you know, one of the fundamental things that runs at least a part of my research is that I am of the strong belief that we can understand something about how people think by looking at the way that people talk about their experiences in the world. And I want to give you an example of this to start off by t showing you a bit of a conversation that took place um, some time ago between a psychotherapist whose name is Judy and a client of hers named Howard. Howard is a guy who is in his late 30s who had recently lost his job and has a relationship that broke up. And so he's talking to his therapist about his life. And let's look at what he says. So Judy, the therapist, goes to Howard, when you have a problem, what do you do with it? And Howard goes, I usually let it be a problem. I don't usually do anything much. Does the problem go away if you don't do anything about it? No, it gets worse. Or it just complicates things as you go further down the road. Can you look at your own life, look down the road of that line, and see what that's going to do in your life? Look down the road. Yeah, kind of visualize what your own life will be like. It will just continue the way it is. Kind of like a snowball effect. No, no, not a snowball, just kind of floating, floating down the river. What's it like to be floating down the river? Tell me more. It's comfortable, it's safe. Everything just keeps on an even keel, you know. You're just kind of floating. Kind of in a canoe going down the river, or no, more like a great old big barge on a great old big river. Barge, very stable kind of. Yeah, plenty of room to spread out and sit in the sun. Yeah, and you don't have to worry about falling off the edge. And sun, you know, it's kind of hazy. It's not really clear sun, it's kind of hazy, kind of half asleep. That's what it's like. What happens when you kind of come to the falls, the falls that are about down there, about two miles down the river? Get the hell off the river. <laughs> well, that's certainly one way to handle it, get out. I feel a lot of discomfort. That's what happened this past month. I hit those falls last month. He was talking about getting fired again. Last uh, time, there was um, kind of an external situation that sort of forced you out of your boat. It was uncomfortable, but I was, I was pretty. I was enjoying it, too, and I didn't want to go back into just floating. Uh, it was uncomfortable, and I was out. I don't, I've been floating a long time. Hmm, well, you found what works for you, in a sense. What works for me? Floating. Because I um, stay comfortable and, in a sense, but it may now be inappropriate. It may not be working as well as it did in the past. Yeah, I need a little excitement now and then. Some rapids, yeah, something I keep in control of and not drown. So this is a wonderful example of a, um, a very common what we call metaphor of thought, a conceptual metaphor where Howard and Judy are thinking of Howard's life as a kind of journey. And thinking of our lives as journeys is a very pervasive kind of metaphor you see in lots of different kinds of languages. We use it in a variety of different domains to talk about aspects of our experience. And this is one of the reasons why many people in cognitive science and other places these days think that there are these things called conceptual metaphors, which are very important elements of how we think and use language. But I think this particular conversation gives a good example of something else that's very important. That is, Howard and Judy here are not just kind of thinking, oh, life is a journey, and talking in very simplistic ways about that. But they're elaborating upon it in a very specific kind of instantiation where Howard's thinking of his life, not just like a journey in general, but he's thinking of it floating down the river in this great old big barge, and it has all these kind of sensuous textures to it. He's lying there in the sun, and it's half, half hazy, and he's floating, and it's kind of stable. It, it has a feeling to it, a texture to it, that I want to argue today is not just a matter of him using words to talk about some aspects of his experience which are non-metaphorical or non-embodied. But this is an example in action of a person engaging in what I call an embodied simulation. And I want to suggest to you that a great deal of how we go through life in the moment to moment of our experience, how we use language, and indeed how we engage in sort of expressive interpretation of things involves these things kind of called embodied simulations. They're fundamental to who we are and how we acquire meaning in the world. So I want to get to that point, but I first want to sort of talk a little bit about this notion of metaphor, conceptual metaphors. And the idea that we think metaphorically has been around for a long, hundreds and thousands of years. But it really became quite forceful in 
academic circles with the writing of the publication of this book, Metaphors, we lived by by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson back in 1980. And they made an argument that metaphor is not just sort of a special rhetorical type of language, but is indeed a fundamental part of ordinary thought, particularly in regard to how we talk about and think about abstract concepts. And what was interesting about their work was they just didn't simply assert this, but they actually began to show through certain kinds of linguistic analysis of a method of how you can infer different kinds of conceptual metaphors. So let me give you just sort of an example. One of the things they did is they looked at these kind of systemat systematicity amongst the conventional expressions in talking about certain things. Like, for example, consider relationships or love relationships. And you have heard things, or you may have said things like, we're headed in opposite directions, we're spinning our wheels, our relationship is at a crossroads, our marriage is on the rocks. I've, I've actually said all of these <laughs> <laughs> many times, at different places, different times. Uh, and each one of these things are not these kind of cliche dead metaphors. But what they argue, like Hoffman Johnson, is that these are reflective of this notion that we're thinking of a love relationship as a kind of journey where we're mapping things that we know about journeys onto structuring this more abstract concept of love relationships. And each of these conventional expressions <coughs> sort of instantiates different aspects of those kinds of mappings. And again, love relationship as a journey is a classic kind of conceptual metaphor. And another thing that they noted that was very interesting is that a lot of our abstract concepts are not structured in terms of just one kind of metaphor, but there's multiple metaphorical ways we conceive of certain domains. So love relationships are not just journeys, there are also things like natural forces, which is why in the more positive times, before I started talking about these bad things, I could be swept off my feet, our waves of passion overcame him, or we were engulfed by love, or we're deeply immersed in love, and this is the notion that love relationship is a kind of natural force. So the idea is that we have these abstract concepts, but they're structured in these kind of multiple kinds of metaphoric ways. And this is a kind of linguistic evidence that they first brought to bear to make this idea that there are these things called conceptual metaphors. Um, a little bit later on, uh, one of the uh, Lakoff students, Joe Grady, made a very kind of important announcement or discovery that there are certain kinds of metaphors that he says are primary in our experience. And this gets to the point that metaphor is not just sort of, again, this abstract cognitive thing, but in fact, it is rooted in embodiment. And in particular, primary metaphors are cases where we're talking about things that are positive correlations in our experience. So in our bodily experience, things that are big tend to be things that are important. Not always, but there's a positive correlation to some significant degree, which is why we can say things metaphorically like tomorrow is a big day. Things that are more up in the world tend to be things that are more, so which is why we can say prices are high. Closeness is a kind of uh, missing nester. Closeness, similarity is a kind of closeness. Those colors aren't the same, but they're close. Uh, change is motion. My health has gone from bad to worse. We think of purposes or correlating with certain, arriving at certain kinds of destinations, like he'll be successful, but he isn't there yet. We think of uh, causes of abstract nature of being like physical forces, so they push the bill through Congress. And we think of understanding, for example, as a kind of grasping, where I've never been able to grasp complex math. So this is important because we begin to think of metaphors not just sort of, again, a linguistic device, but something that's part of thought. But it's a part of thought that fundamentally arises in many cases from our recurring embodied experiences in the world. So in that sense, metaphor is embodied. And our abstract concepts, to a large degree, may in fact themselves be embodied or rooted in embodied experience. Over the years, conceptual metaphor theory, as it's been uh, known to uh, be called, has accumulated a huge amount of different kinds of empirical evidence. So I've mentioned some of the things about systematicity amongst conventional expressions, which we've seen in almost virtually every language that's ever been studied at various different kinds of historical time periods, in various different domains. Uh, there's uh, a, a variety of work looking at novel extensions of these conventional metaphors. So if I say, this is not that novel, but my marriage was a roller coaster ride from hell, part of the reason why you're able to understand that novel expression is because it, it is a, a creative instantiation of a conventional idea that love relationships are kinds of journeys. And this is a, an example of a, a specific kind of journey, which makes it novel, but it's still rooted in an enduring kind of conceptual metaphor. Various aspects of polysemy, for example, I finally see the point of your argument. 
So the uh, polysemy referring to multiple related word meanings, uh, senses of a word that are related, um, is actually structured here again by a uh, conceptual metaphor, understanding as a kind of scene. People have looked at um, conceptual metaphors and how they influence uh, the evolution of language. One of the big areas that um, is really hip these days in cognitive linguistics world is looking at non-linguistic communication, for example, like Larry's talk about conceptual metaphors in music. That's an incredibly important kind of uh, domain, metaphorical gestures. And let me just, for example, stop and give you, uh, I didn't put this as a slide, but there's just been some incredibly interesting evidence in psychology that um, people are gathering. And they, they're not doing it for the purpose of metaphor per se, but I think it relates to metaphor. So quite quickly, if you do an experiment, and this has been done, where you bring a person into the laboratory, before they come into the laboratory, you give them a cup of coffee to hold. And if the, if the, coffee, cup, if the coffee is hot, it's warm, you take it away and then you sit the person down and you say, can you please read this story about a fictional person and then rate what your impression of this person is. If the coffee they were holding was warm, they'll rate that person in much more affectionate, warm terms than if they hold a cold cup of coffee. So the simple embodied experience of warmth sort of primes the notion of affection, which is a kind of primary metaphor. Affection is a kind of warmth. When people talk about their futures, they lean forward physically, and people have measured this. When they talk about their past, they lean backwards. They do this just automatically without even thinking about it. Um, when people tell, you bring a person to lab, you have them tell a lie to someone else, after the experiment, you say, thank you for being in this experiment. You have a gift. You can have some candy, or you can use one of these antiseptic wipes. The people were asked to lie, go, oh, I'll take the white, and they want to clean themselves because they just did something that was dirty. Right? These are these lovely kind of results that we're seeing of these kind of, again, these primary metaphors, these correlations are experienced. So this isn't just language. This is something we really do live and experience. So there's a lot of work in these kind of non-linguistic social domains that are really, again, I think are consistent with some of these work, these ideas in conceptual metaphor. Gesture is a big thing these days, metaphorical gestures. There's several people who've been doing these computational models or these neural theories of metaphor. And people like myself have done a bunch of work on the psycholinguistics. And I just want to give you two examples of some work that I think is consistent with the idea that people are accessing or recruiting something about conceptual metaphors when they understand language. And this is pretty simple kind of stuff. This is some stuff I did a long time ago um, looking at how people interpret poetry. And I gave people poems to read, different kinds of poems. And then I'd give them these fragments from the poems after they had read them. And I said, for example, this is from an uh, uh, early American poet, Anne Bradstreet. So if ever two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by a wife, then thee. And I just said, OK, which of these themes do you think best reflects what that little fragment was about? And you know, people, undergraduate students, 19-year-old students in California go, I don't know, how about love is a unity? They see some sense of this poem being related to this kind of theme. And they do it quite consistently. 72% is a great deal, which reflects, I think, of some tacit understanding of a conceptual metaphor, which might be motivating this particular poetic fragment. And another version, a different experiment, people read poems, again, these love poems, and they wrote out what they thought about them, or what they thought their meanings were, on a line-by-line -line basis. And then I kind of went back and did this analysis of all the things that people wrote. So here's an example from the a lovely poem by Pablo Neruda, where at one point he talks about his love relationship with this person, this woman. And at one point he goes, discovering another the secret road that gradually brought your feet closer to mine. And a person wrote this, you know, uh, I think this is about how a person learned a better path to happiness, which reflects the notion of a love as a journey. And in fact, 78% of all the things that people wrote were consistent with certain kinds of conceptual metaphors for these certain kinds of poetic fragments. So the idea is that conceptual metaphors don't explain the whole meaning of these fragments. But it's indeed something that's relevant, that's a, a constraint, a strong constraint on how these poetic fragments came into being and how people seem to understand them. At a different level, part of a lot of the work that I've done is to try and say, look, there are these conventional kinds of metaphors that traditionally in literature and linguistics we think as dead metaphors. And like in American idioms, we have these expressions like blow your stack, flip your lid, hit the ceiling, which are all uh, used to talk about the notion of anger. 
And what I've tried to do for quite a long time is to say these are not dead metaphors. In fact, if you do a kind of traditional cognitive linguistic analysis of their systematicity, they all reflect some aspect of the idea that we think of anger conceptually in terms of the source domain, heated fluid in the bodily container, and that we use our embodied experience of heated fluid in the bodily container to help us structure and understand aspects of the notion of anger. And so if this is the case, when people understand or use these expressions, they should be recruiting aspects of this conceptual embodied metaphor. So how do, I, how do we show that might be the case? And so here's just one of many kinds of experiments I've done. So I brought people in and I said, you know, let's just first of all look, what do people think about the source domain? Forget the notion of anger. Just what do you think about the source domain? What is your folk knowledge about this? So I asked them about imagining the embodied experience of a sealed container with fluid, or your, what is that like? And then they sort of imagined it for a minute. And I asked them these questions. What would cause the container to explode? And again, these are my 18, 19 year old students in Santa Cruz, and they go, I don't know, uh, uh, pressure, internal pressure. Very consistent. Does the ex container explode accidentally or on purpose? 88% said accidentally. Does the explosion occur in a gentle or violent manner? 94% of the people said it was violent. So we know just very crudely something about the nature of heated fluid in the bottom of the container under these kinds of constraints. These are things that we know. So are these things mapped, therefore, onto our understanding of anger when we use these idioms? And the way that I looked at this is to have a different kind of a study where people came in to the laboratory, sat them down, and they read various kinds of stories like this one. Sally was preparing for a big dinner party. She had to do a great deal of cooking. <coughs> Her husband was supposed to help, but was very late getting home from work. When he strolled in 10 minutes before the party, whistling and smiling, and then people saw either an idiom, Sally blew her stack, or some kind of literal or non-metaphorical paraphrase, Sally got very angry. Now, do you have the same kind of interpretation of both of these? According to the dead metaphor view, these are exactly the same. The, de the expression, Sally blew your stack, simply equals Sally got very angry. But under the conceptual metaphor theory, it should be something richer because it's motivated by the mapping of the source domain knowledge. So what they did in the, had to do in this task is they saw either the idiom or the paraphrase. And at the end, they had to simply rate their agreement with three statements. Sally got very angry because she was under a great deal of pressure, which refers to this notion of causation. Sally got very angry without intending to do so, which refers to this notion of intentionality. And Sally got very angry in a very forceful manner, which refers to Manner, and again, this causation, intentionality, and manner are things we learned from the prior study, asking people about the source domain. And the prediction here is that people should be, give much higher ratings of agreements to these statements, having read the idiom, than the literal paraphrase. Because they're inferring this when they hear or read the idiom, but not the literal paraphrase. And here are some numbers. We in, we in psychology, we love numbers experimental psychologists anyway. And so in general, the point is that the higher the ratings, the more agreement. And you see that uh, statistically speaking here, there's much higher ratings of agreement to the causation, the intentionality and manner questions given the idioms than literal paraphrases. So what this suggests is that when you use an idiom like you know, Sally blew her stack, it doesn't just mean that she got very angry. But people have tacit understandings that it means getting very angry because of internal pressure where the anger was expressed accidentally and done so in a violent manner. And these are part of our deep, rich interpretation of these cliched expressions. And it's predicted and motivated by the fact that these things come from, arise from different kinds of conceptual metaphors. So as I say here, metaphorical mappings between embodied source domains, heated fluid in the bodily container, and target domains like anger motivates the specific figurative meanings that many idioms have. And therefore, people have specific metaphorical concepts of abstract ideas, like emotions, that are shaped by recurring bodily experiences, such as their experience as body as containers. So part of the, the prominence of this conceptual metaphor theory is it can account for these conventional cliched expressions, which most people who are literary theorists, like those are just boring, dead metaphors. But they're reflective of the fact, under this view, that people are thinking about many kinds of domains in metaphorical ways that are grounded in various kinds of embodied experiences. Now, traditionally, there's thinking about the way that conceptual metaphors have been talked about in the, in the, in the literature. 
Um, people think of these things in some ways as, okay, we have these conceptual metaphors in there in our minds, and when we hear a certain piece of language, we kind of activate it or recruit this from our long-term memory, and we use it and apply it to help structure something. Some literature, some speech, a piece of music, something, a gesture. And what I'm going to try and suggest to you is that's the wrong way to think about this. That instead, what we are doing, again, when we're thinking metaphorically, we're engaged in these kinds of what I call embodied, or people call embodied simulations. So conceptual metaphors are not static structures. They're not stored as lists in long-term memory apart from their embodied roots. But rather, people's understanding of verbal kinds of metaphors, in particular, is not done, again, by activating these things from memory. But understanding uh, excuse me, metaphorical language involves embodied simulations of what certain actions, including source to target domains, mappings, and language, must be like or feel like. So we're hearing language, and we're, we're, we're thinking, we're imagining for ourselves what must that be like. And we do this in a full-bodied, simulative ways. And I wanted to say that the process of running these kinds of simulations and what they produce represents our understandings of metaphor. So here's two examples, quickly. Um, this is about a, a parrot. There was this parrot that was studied by a person at Harvard for a long time, just recently died. But it had all these incredible cognitive abilities. And this is from a newspaper story. Parrot progeny may grasp the concept of zero. And here's another one. Journalists who grasp the concept of courage. Now, zero and courage are not things that you can physically grasp. So grasp is being used, metaphorically here, we think of grasping as a kind of understanding. And what I want to suggest here is that usually when you think about how people understand these things, we go, you've got to get beyond the physical grasping. You've got to reject the literal meaning and somehow get to the figurative meaning. But I want to suggest here is that what you're doing, if you're running a simulation, you're imagining yourself grasping. And you're grasping what? A metaphorical object, like the concept of zero or this idea of courage. And as you're thinking, what is it like to grasp this thing? And you're, you're, you're imagining what that feels like. And you can grasp it. And if you can hold on to it, you can examine it. The more you can examine it, the more you understand it. And so this is par part of the point I'm going to try and suggest by showing these different kinds of experiments. But constructing this kind of embodied simulation, in my view, creates a sense of what it must be like for others, such as speakers or writers, to have the specifics they do during communication. So when someone says, you know, I couldn't grasp complex math, I'm thinking what that must be like for you to imagine that situation of not being able to fit, literally, in some sense, grasp this object, this abstract kind of thing. Imaginative simulations are mental actions similar to those overtly referred to in the language. Right? So you, you think about the grasping of a concept as something that can actually physically be done. It's a simulation that's not abstract. It isn't like what a meteorologist does when they simulate like a hurricane. That's, a, that's abstract. But rather, this is, I think, the, the analogy I want to use is like what it must be like to be in an aircraft simulator. Like you're, you're flying this aircraft simulator, and it has sensory uh, impressions upon you. It feels like you're moving as if you're flying the plane, although you're not flying. What we're doing when we understand language, including metaphor, is we're doing that. We're like flying the plane. We're imagining what it must be like. And it feels something to us. These are not things that are done necessarily consciously, although they can be done consciously in certain cases. But these are mostly performed automatically as part of our ordinary experience. One of the reasons why I think this is an interesting idea, <laughs> and this isn't the only by any means, but it's something which is kind of popular these days for better or for worse in cognitive science, this is this, these findings of mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are part of your premortal cortex, which they found in both uh, uh, monkeys as well as, of course, in humans, that when we watch someone do something, parts of our brain are acting as if we ourselves are doing the thing we're watching. And this is incredibly interesting, and in fact, to some extent, it tells us perception is not just sort of us statically perceiving something. It's us imagining what it would be like if we were engaged in the action that we're actually watching. We see this uh, also in terms of how we understand what's intentional in others. It's a very big notion in terms of mind reading and empathy. So when I'm empathetic to something you're experiencing, it's because I'm running a simulation of what this must be like. And my mirror neurons are active. 
language use it's something that people shown is relevant when you hear certain kinds of words your 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 premotor cortex is acting as if you are actually performing the actions associated with those words listening to music something you hear music but you're actually it's almost as if you're performing the music in some crude sense so this is relevant to the why I think embodied simulations are, are important here when you understand and use metaphor. Embodied simulations are also interesting to me, and this is all personal stuff, because uh, fantasies and nightmares. Um, let me start with sex. When you, when you imagine having sex, when you have a sexual fantasy, and it's about time we talk more about sexual fantasies and cognitive science. But when you have a sexual <laughs> fantasy, you're not just kind of like, activating abstract propositions in your head. You're running this thing and it has these effects upon you. You feel certain things, you may move certain parts of your body, certain parts of your body may move. You're running this simulation as if you are engaging in that kind of activity. Skydiving. Um, I can run a simulation of what it's like to jump out of a plane. And doing that makes me never want to jump out of a plane. I'd be scared, I'm scared to death of that idea. I don't understand why anybody does that. Because I've run the simulation enough so that I know that's not something I wish to do. And one of the beauties of embodied simulations in this relationship to you think about these things consciously is it tells you what you should and shouldn't do. You shouldn't jump off the top of buildings because that may not work out so well. And you can run the simulation of why that, why that is. And why, so this is, again, another reason why Simulations are important. Dunking at basketball, this is very personal to me. I used to play basketball a lot, and then I got old and crippled, and so I can't do it anymore. Um, and it's interesting, when I, back when I was playing, I, I, I'm not that tall and I wasn't very good, but there were these occasions, these rare occasions where I could get up and dunk the basketball. You know what I mean? I could slam the basket and the, the ball into the basket. I have only done that maybe 10 times in my entire life, back when I was young and athletic and so forth. And the fact of the matter is I can no longer do that. And for many years after I stopped playing basketball, I would watch basketball on TV and go, yeah, you know, I can still do that. I can still, yeah, 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 I can do it. I watch. And over time, I've noticed an interesting thing. I can't imagine myself doing it anymore. It just, I can't run the simulation. It just doesn't feel, I can't, I'm too old. I just can't do it. And it actually has a very interesting perceptual effect is that I walk around in the world now when I see a basket. A basket, the rim is 10 feet high. And I had these neighbor kids, and they were playing at a basket, go, you know, that rim's way too high. You've got to lower it. It's way too high. And these kids go, get out of here, old man. What are you talking about? It's, just, it's 10 feet. It's perfect. And I was going around and go, all the basket, the rims are, are higher than they used to be. <laughs> and my, I have not shrunk. I'm still six foot five inches tall. My vision is almost exactly the same. The point is, that looks further away to me perceptually because I can't run the simulation to get up there anymore. And so it's really kind of creepy because it's like, oh, I used to be able to, I just, I, I, I see the world differently and that's one small sense because my sense of running that simulation has completely deteriorated. So, welcome to my life. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but I think it's a good example of how we walk around and we're doing these, perception is itself, a, a kind of embodied simulation of what we think we're able to do with objects and activities. So this is evidence, I think, in a, a very personal phenomenological way of why embodied simulations is relevant. Um, this is a guy who was at an air guitar, international air guitar conference, and he's listening to a piece and he's doing it. He's like wailing away there. This is what we do when we read literature. This, because you know why? Because we're hearing this, we're reading the text. This is a, my argument. We're reading the text, we're reading a poem, and we're simulating what that must be like, what that feels like. And so he's listening to music, and he's doing this thing. This, now, this maybe he's practiced this before, probably, this particular piece. But this is, this is my vision of what happens cognitively when we use language, including metaphor. We run this simulation, and it has a feel to it. So that we're it's a full-bodied kind of thing. It isn't just from the eyebrows up. It's a full-bodied brain-body-world interaction that we're doing when we're creating these simulations. And I want to suggest that when we're using metaphor, we're doing something like this. Now, maybe obviously not as overt as this. But at some level, when we're, we're interacting with people in the world, part of our 
our interpretation is this kind of expression. So our interpretations are themselves expressive acts, and this is a good example of this. So let's see if there's any kind of other uh, evidence that we can bring to this. And you, a lot of people who like the notions of simulation go, okay, that's fine, but can we simulate in a bodily sense things that are abstract and physically that are impossible to perform, like grasping of concepts? And I think metaphor provides an ideal case study to try and look for such evidence because, again, people have been skeptical about this idea, particularly in regard to abstract concepts and metaphor. So let me just give you a couple of examples of some research that I've done that I think is consistent with the simulation point of view. This is work where I've looked at people's understanding of these simple phrases like chew in the idea, grasp the concept, stand up for justice, throw away friendship, cough up a secret, stamp out your feelings, stretch for understanding, push an issue, right? So there's this physical um, kind of verb and this is this kind of abstract kind of compliment here. And uh, Again, typically people argue that you know, when you understand these things, you've got to get beyond the physicality of the verbs and get to sort of the metaphoricity of what's really being pointed out here. But I want to suggest, again, that we're, we're really simulating what these actions must be like and thinking of things like ideas, friendships, feelings, and so forth as metaphorical things that we can do, that we can hang on to as objects. And if this is the case, then moving your body in a way that's relevant to these actions should facilitate your understanding of what these phrases are about. Right? And that's, again, it's contrary to everything we know in psycholinguistics thus far about how we think metaphor understanding is. But I want to say moving your body in ways that are relevant to these actions will actually facilitate your interpretation of these phrases and not interfere. And the way that I did it is the following. Here's a, a demonstration of the method. I first brought people into a laboratory and they watched these vi this video of a person who would hold up an icon like a star and they when they engage in a, a, an action like swallowing and then they hold up an at sign and they cough, they hold up a dollar sign and grasp and they would do this for a series of 16 kind of actions and the participants task was to memorize what icon went with what action. And they did this to some level of criteria. And then I brought them into the main experiment. They sat in front of a computer terminal. And a, particular, a, a trial went like this. On the computer terminal would be a flash and icon. The icon would tell the subject to do this action, the action that you just memorized to do. And after they did this action, a phrase would come on the screen. And then they simply had to push a button as soon as they understood the phrase. So the three conditions of interest here, one, a condition where the prime, that is the action, is consistent with the target so that you first are given the icon to swallow, you swallow, and then you see swallow your pride. A second condition is where these two things are inconsistent, where you first grasp and then you see something that's irrelevant to that or inconsistent with this, like swallow your pride. And finally, a sort of a baseline is a no prime condition where you know, did no action and then simply um, had to understand the phrase swallow your pride. And the idea is that somehow the prediction would be that this is going to prime your ability to the speed with which you understand swallow your pride compared to the no prime condition. And this is uh, some numbers, excuse me for numbers. Um, this is the amount of time it takes people in milliseconds. So on average, it takes people just under 3,000 milliseconds or three seconds to read these expressions when there's no prime. When it's mismatching, it's slower. It's not significantly statistically slower, but somewhat slower. So that slows you down. But there's what we call this nice, sweet, lovely priming effect, where the amount of time it takes to do this in the matching condition was significantly faster than the amount of time it took people to do this in the no prime condition. This reflects just sort of standard deviations. One possibility here. And this is important in trying to do this kind of work. What are the alternative ways of explaining this data without believing the hypothesis? And one possibility here is that, well, maybe when people uh, perform an action like grasping or swallowing, that primes the lexical item for it. So it's just priming the words, and the word primes the words when they read the, state, the sentences. Turns out, if you do a, a, a study where they watch the videotapes of the actions, and they were just simply asked, or say, what is a word that describes those actions? 
people can kind of guess the correct word about 43% of the time. If you loosen the criteria to something that's synonymous about 60% of the time. But then if you do a correlation between their guessing of these verbs and the amount of time, it should be negative. There's the, the, law, the more you can guess it, the faster you should understand it. But it turns out these correlations are actually in the positive direction. So it isn't the case that people are simply doing an action and that's activating a, a lexical item. That's not the thing that's going on here. In a second experiment, I've done the same thing. But this time, when they saw the action, the icon on the computer, they imagined themselves doing the action as opposed to actually doing it. Now, there's some work that shows that people, for example, when they imagine doing certain kinds of actions, you get nice activation of your, uh, your mirror neurons. So maybe just imagining doing these actions itself can prime. And in fact, we find exactly the same kind of effect. The no prime is about three seconds, significantly faster to do it in the matching case. And here we have a nice interference. This is now statistically slower. So that doing something that mismatches slows you down in understanding it, just simply by imagining the actions. And once again, these correlations, if you do this control study for guessing, is not nearly in the right direction. To, so it's not really a, a sense that they're actually doing or imagining these actions, and that's activating a lexical item. It's something that people, when they're, if they're moving their bodies in a particular way, that helps them run the simulation, to create the simulation. And this is what I think happens when people talk. They're gesturing. They're moving their bodies. They're doing all this in a coordinated fashion. And part of it is an outward manifestation of these kinds of simulations that they're doing. And I think this is partial evidence for it. One more study. This is a, um, one that I talk about. This is a kind of study that you can do if you already have tenure. It's called Walking the Walk While Thinking About the Talk. And it's a bizarre experiment, a set of experiments. And I'm only going to give you part of it. And here's an example of the, 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 the narratives that I was looking at. Imagine you were a single person. A, friendly, a friend sets you up on a blind date. You really like this person start dating frequently. Your relationship was moving along in a good direction. So here's our old friend. Relationships are journeys. Okay, so what happens here? Well, then it got even better. The relationship felt like it was the best you ever had. This continues to this day. No matter what happens, the two of you are quite happy together. In the second story, imagine you're a single person. A friend sets you up on a blind date. You really like this person and start dating frequently. Your relationship is moving along in a good direction. So this is exactly the same as the beginning of this. But the second story here, this sort of unsuccessful story, it's different. But then you experience some difficulties. The relationship did not feel the same as before. This lasted for some time. No matter how hard, uh, hard uh, you tried, uh, the two of you are not getting along. My argument is that when you see something like your relationship is moving along in a good direction, you are imagining what that must be like. There's a sense of physical movement involved. But because of the context here, the nature of the extent of the movement in these two stories is going to be slightly different. Right? So the first one is successful. Uh, there's a sense of faster, further, Maybe, as I'm going to say in a minute, more in a straight line. The second one, fast, and then slowing down because the relationship was not going anywhere, which is like, where is this going? <laughs> you ever heard that question? Where is this relationship going? That's a, a question about the nature of the underlying metaphor at, at stake here. So I want to see how, if we, if we actually have a sense of movement when we read these kinds of stories, that is different across the two stories. And one of the things that's interesting, if you ask people to read these two stories and then just say, which of these two stories would you pick and answer the following questions? Which relationship progressed further? 90% picked the successful. Which is progressing faster at the beginning? Well, they're exactly identical at the beginning, and so both of them get about the same. Um, which relationship is progressing faster at present? So between the two stories, people pick the successful one. Which relationship progressed more in a, a straight line? They significantly more pressed, uh, picked the successful one. And in which relationship were the, heading, the individuals heading the same direction? They picked the successful one. None of these inferences were stated in the stories whatsoever. These were, again, inferences. But people, when they're understanding your relationship is moving along in a good direction, they, they think this metaphorical narrative and these embodied things are coming out that they are having a sense of when they read the different kinds of stories. And so they can distinguish between the two stories in these ways. 
If you ask people to read the same stories, but you take the metaphor out and give them a non-metaphorical thing, your relationship was very important to you, and give them the same sets of questions, the, the effects are attenuated. They don't go uh, disappear, which is itself kind of interesting. But you no longer see the big significant difference between the two kinds of stories. Um, because they're not thinking about the relationships in the same degree metaphorically. So you get different kinds of things going on there. So I want to see if people are really thinking of the successful versus the unsuccessful in a metaphorical way that's embodied simulation and thinking about one thing moving faster and progressing further, how do I measure that? So this is the, the methodology that I used. I brought people out to a, a field at the University of California Santa Cruz campus. And I, simply had them listen to a, one of these two, one of these four stories. Metaphor successful, unsuccessful, non-metaphor successful, unsuccessful. And they heard the stories, and at the end, as when they were doing, they were standing at a point, and they were looking, 40 feet away was a, te a yellow tennis ball. All right? So they heard the story, and at the end of the story, I blindfolded them, and I said, walk out to that tennis ball thinking about the story you just heard. Yeah, okay, and then they would just kind of, <laughs> kind of wander out, and then they'd stop, okay? And then we'd come out, we'd measure where they were and so forth, and we asked them a question about what kind of mood they were in. And here's the, here's the results that's totally, I think, totally cool. When people in this one condition, I'm going to tell you about it, they listened to the story, they were blindfolded, and they walked to the ball. The people who heard the successful story walked significantly longer in time, 15.1 versus 12.1, and interestingly enough, not only did they walk w longer, they w I mean, temporarily uh, distant longer, they, they overshot the tennis ball by average of four feet for the successful one, and they undershot it by one and a half feet for the unsuccessful one. And this isn't a mood effect. In fact, anything, people actually recorded the mood was slightly better for the unsuccessful one. I, I did that as a, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you, you hear the story about a relationship that's no, going no good and it kind of reminds you of your own life and you get bummed out and you walk <laughs> slow. It turns out these mood effects don't predict anything, at least in these experiments. But we have this difference in people's in, physical experience and thinking about these stories while they were doing this walking thing. So we get these differences with the metaphors. We don't get them for the non-metaphor. They're not thinking of it in the same kind of in, similar kind of embodied terms because we're not thinking of a relationship as a kind of journey that has a physical dimension to it. And the same amount of time in terms of uh, time and distance, they both uh, undershot the ball and these are not statistically different. So this is, I think, interesting kind of evidence, supportive of the notion that when you understand these narratives, these metaphorical narratives, you're running these simulations. And depending upon the context, the simulation will be slightly different. I won't go into details about this other kind of study, but I, one thing I said, well, maybe, you know, what happens if you just gave them two very positive, successful relationship stories, but gave them different metaphors? One having to do with journeys, uh, one having to do with a different kind of conceptual metaphor, where relationships are manufactured objects, which is uh, illustrated by the notion that we're building a solid foundation. And it turns out you get the same kind of distance walking effects for the first one, but not the second because it's a different kind of conceptual metaphor, a different kind of simulation that you're building. And I think if you actually did a different task about verticality or something, or support or something, you, you'll find evidence for this compared to the other. So I think this is interesting uh, evidence that doesn't prove the simulation point, which I think, but it's still s um, supportive of the idea that we're running these embodied simulations as part of our understanding of verbal metaphors. So the conclusions I want to suggest here is that metaphor in general and our understanding of metaphor allows us to kind of imaginatively project ourselves into the lives and worlds of other people. That's one of the reasons why metaphor is such an interesting uh, uh, device. This imaginative engagement arises from meta-understanding, not as an after-the-fact reaction to metaphor, but as a fundamental part of how we ordinarily interpret metaphorical meaning. So this is important in the following sense. It isn't, and we talk about what, how do you get these aesthetic responses to different kinds of things, like for example, literature. The perspective I want to suggest here, it isn't like you understand it cognitively and then you kind of react emotionally to it, but rather there is an aesthetic sense that comes from the running of, the, the building and running of the simulation. It's not an after the fact thing, it's part of what you're doing, it's part of the understanding process where the emotional response, the aesthetic 
um, reactions come from. People may create embodied simulations of speakers' messages that involve moment by moment what it must be like processes, which make use of ongoing tactile kinesthetic experiences. And I think these kinds of processes operate both uh, when people use and understand metaphoric language that is otherwise referring to actions that are physically impossible to perform. Right, so this is a good, a strong case again for the simulation view uh, applying to abstract language and metaphorical language. And I can go into more detail about why these findings are congruent with a whole bunch of evidence in cognitive science showing these kind of intimate connections between perceptual sensory motor experiences, our conceptual knowledge and our language understanding. So let me end though with this one final way of thinking again, these in, in simulations in a more practical context. Um, I recently read a really interesting book by a, an author called Nicholson Baker who wrote a novel called The Anthologist. And if, you, if you're interested in literature or poetry, it's a great novel because it's about a guy who's a poet and he's just made this edited collection of poetry and he has to write the introduction and he can't do it. He's just got this worse writer's block because his life's miserable and his girlfriend left him and he can't do it. And it's driving him nuts. And the whole thing is about him meditating about the fact that he can't like do this, at, that, do this thing. And he thinks he's also not able to write poetry anymore. And so one point in the novel, he, he mentions this, talks about his dilemma. And I'm going to read this to you, and I, and I want to suggest to you that part of your understanding of it, part of your appreciation of it, is indeed, again, through this embodied simulation of what it must be like for him in the moment, because you feel this yourselves. He goes, I wish I could spill forth the wisdom of 20 years of reading and writing poetry, but I am not sure I can. Now it's like I'm on some an infinitely tall ladder. You know, the way that old aluminum ladders have the texture, that kind of not too appealing roughness of texture, and that kind of cold gray color. I'm clinging to this telescoping ladder that leads up to, into the blinding blue. The world is somewhere very far below. I don't know how I got here. It's a mystery. When I look up, I see people climbing rung by rung. I see Jory Graham. I see Billy Collins, these poets. I see Ted Kuzner. They're all climbing to the ladder, too. And above them, I see Auden, Kunitz. Whoa, way up there, Samuel Daniels, Aratiz, Herrick. Tiny figures clamoring, climbing. The wind comes over, and it's cold, and the ladder vibrates. And I feel very exposed and high up. Off to one side, there's Helen Vendler great American critic, and I love this, and her trusty dirigible. If you know anything about her, when I first read this, that's perfect for her. <laughs> Filming our ascent, talking about what's going on with all these poets and their works. And I look down, and there are many people behind me. They're hurrying up to where I am. They're 23-year-old energetic climbing creatures in their anorics and their goggles, and I'm trying to keep climbing, but my hands are cold and going numb. My arms are tired to tremble, and it's freezing, and it's lonely, and there's nobody to talk to. And what if I just let go? What if I just loosened my grip and fell to one side and just whoosh, let go? Would that be such a bad thing? So this is, a, you know, a, 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 I think, a beautiful instantiation of a kind of journey thing. And it's a specific kind of journey. And I feel, I used to be a house painter, climbing ladder. I feel like I'm there on the ladder holding on, the textures of it, the wind blowing, the people climbing. There's a sense of not like I'm just understanding this abstractly and having these more again, abstract poetic associations to it. It feels like I'm there in the moment because I'm running this simulations of this broader metaphorical kind of narrative. Many years ago, the great American poet Wallace Stephen once wrote, he's famous for writing about all these aphorisms. Reality is a cliche from which we escape by metaphor. And this goes to the heart of the paradox of metaphor in my life and why there's something about when I read things like Nicholson Baker and his literary thing here and these poets and so forth. I love metaphor because it does make me have this transcendent experience. It feels like I'm beyond myself. I love it for that quality. But I also, I think, because of the work I and many others have done, have come to a very important conclusion that that transcendence is not simply a non-cognitive, beyond body kind of thing. But in fact, metaphor is a significant part of both indeed mundane and create a reality that is inescapable. It isn't like we escape from reality by metaphor. Metaphor is an inescapable part of our, our experience. And in this way, thought and language are inherently grounded in our embodied actions and our imaginative powers.
to conceive of abstract ideas and events in bodily form. Thank you very much for your attention. Are you sure? Yes, of course. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm, I'm, it's all, everything you say is going to be right, but I don't understand how, given that we, we agree that uh, it makes no sense to talk about literally grasping a concept. A concept is not the kind of thing that can be literally grasped. How can it, how could it, there's a question about why does it help me understand understanding? Because so, to be activating these bodies. Because, in again, if you think of a concept as an abstract thing that can't be literally grasped, but if you metaphorically conceive of that thing as an object, then indeed grasping it is the way to understand it. Because indeed, from our experiences in the world, the, the more we're able to hang, on to, to hang on to things, to grasp things, to hang on to it, to examine it, to turn it over, the better it is that we can understand it. So, our, our fundamental reflex is to think about abstract things in metaphorical kinds of terms. But why our understanding of the... What? Why isn't that just a mistake? Why isn't, why, to think but of it is, here's the thing. It, it, it isn't a mistake at all. It makes perfect sense. And this is part of... That's a good question. Part of the reason why I think we need to ask as our linguists and psychologists, why do we talk in these ways? Why do we talk about concepts in terms of things that we can grasp? Why don't we talk about concepts of things of like we can use mowing the lawn or any other thing. Why do we use those particular things, those particular words? Because again, our embodied experience is such, again, so that we have these experiences like grasping that are correlated in a positive way with our abilities to understand things. So it makes sense for us to talk and think in these metaphorical kinds of ways because of our embodied experiences. So I think this is why there's this really lovely link between our bodily experiences, our ways of metaphorically conceiving of topics, and the ways that we speak about them. There's a linkage between them, so that our metaphorical language is not arbitrary. It actually is motivated and grounded in aspects of our bodily experience. So I think it, it provides an explanation for why we talk about things in the ways that we do. Well, I mean, there's still, once you're mapped concepts on the hand-sized objects, right. then it makes sense to think of understanding of the game like No, no, I don't think it's a matter of once you do it. This is actually a, a debate within the, the metaphor field to some extent. It's not, a, I think, just a matter of once you've done it, but you only can think about it initially by engaging the metaphorical projection. You can't think of ideas other than the, unless you think about them as things that you, for example, can grasp onto. They're not, there's not even ideas. It's, it's like this is, these are things that you, it, it, the metaphor helps bring the, the notion of an idea as an abstract entity into the being. So these bodies, because you can't get it right until you get it wrong. <laughs> I, yeah. Create the metaphor in order to understand it. The metaphor yeah. is not the thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. What about things like, uh, where it's like a head? Are, you know, it's sort of a fossil from, from yeah. uh, seafaring days. Right. And it, it does, I don't think, I wouldn't think that it would call up for most people sure. naturally that, that meaning of, you know, toward the front right. of the ship or the direction we're going. Not the way something like a stern might right. if you were a sailor. But if you're not a sailor, right. a stern probably just makes you think for a long time right. and have to dredge. Right. So, you know, is, is that like a, a third category <coughs> where, in a way, I, I, I'll grant that the ahead somehow gives you more mm -hmm. than toward where we're going mm -hmm. or some such locution. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it right to say that it's a metaphor? Mm -hmm. or, or is it maybe just something that we've learned from context? Sure. This is, a, this is, a, this is a, an articulation of the alternative hypothesis, which is, I think is exactly the kind of thing we should always be doing, and which I sometimes think cognitive linguists don't do enough. First of all, I don't think there is a single theory of metaphor that can account for all aspects of metaphorical kind of language. Metaphor and idioms, to take another example, are these incredibly complex, rich sorts of things. I think the simulation view 
and the conceptual metaphor of you and the embodied conceptual metaphor of you works for some significant huge part of it. There are some things which are indeed truly dead that we have no idea why, they, why, we, are, why we talk those ways. Um, why do we talk about death in terms of kicking of buckets? Right. Now, you could probably all maybe come up with a guess on that, and some of your guesses might be right, but a lot of times they're wrong. So some of these things, the conceptual metaphor perspective, the embodied perspective, although interesting, kicking the bucket, I think you all recognize that kicking the bucket refers to dying fast or slow and fast or slow? Fast. fast right? So there's something to do with the fact that we talk about kicking and the notion of dying. There's something the lexical has some influence upon it. But um, the point being is that still there's some language that this perspective that I'm giving you is, may not be able to explain entirely. But here's the question, or rather the issue for me is that simply asking people to kind of just off the top of their head say this is not necessarily the way to understand whether or not they have true underlying motivational knowledge of why things mean what they do. This is why you have to kind of do cognitive linguistics, why you have to do, in my case, psychological experiments that tap into what people know that they don't know that they know, right? So sometimes I, I hear, oh, well, no, this, isn't a, this I don't, doesn't work in German or some language. We don't do it that way. Well, it turns out if you do the right experiment, if you do the right kind of analysis, people do have tacit knowledge about the motivations for why certain words mean what they do. And there might be individual differences, maybe because people who are sailors may have certain experiences that allows them to tap into certain meanings in a sense that other people do. But you have to do the empirical work to find out, rather than just simply, what I don't like is when people come up with a counterexample, which and say, so the whole thing has to be wrong. It really is a matter of like, sure, there's lots of room for that kind of perspective. But in general, I think that the idea of the conceptual metaphor, embodied metaphor, and in simulations really does reflect some significant part of what we do when we're using of language. And I also think it's how we perceive things in the world. So it isn't just specific to language, but it's, it's, it's a fundamental big part of what we do in our experiences. Yes. So, so one thing you've got me wondering about is, is, is how necessary or contingent the feature of our language is this action might be. So um, let's see how to put it. Is there, is, is, I guess the part of the claim might be that uh, we're like our, our facility with, with um, making like, with both with interpreting and producing uh, metaphors is, is supposed to be helpful because it gets us sort of talking in this common language, right? That, mm -hmm. that it allows us to immediately see from the other person's perspective mm -hmm. what it's like because we all have the same experience of say you know resting an object, right? Yes. Um, so is is the idea that that, that sort of stuck? Like as a, as a feature of our language use because it helped us sort of coordinate in, in, in those ways that language is, uh, is good for? Well, I, this, uh, let me rephrase what you're saying and see if, and see if that makes sense to you. Um, I don't, again, I don't want to say this is just simply a matter of language teaching us how to think about things. I think the fact that we have the particular kinds of recurring metaphorical patterns in language do, with that we do, is motivated, again, by kinds of bodily experiences. So some of these things come from the body up. And it gives rise to these different kinds of metaphors. So that's one way of thinking about how these things come into being and why they have the meanings they do. Certainly, the given, particularly given the fact that there are certain abs many abstract domains can be understood in multiple kinds of metaphors, means that we have a, a lot of flexibility in terms of how we think of, say, what love relationships are. And it is interesting that even though we do have similar bodily experiences, perhaps, I've also been in marriages where some of us say, hey, love is like a journey, and things are changing and so forth, and let's rock and roll here. And you know, the other person was going, ah, it's a, it's a, a building. We're staying still. And we're building this thing. And even though we love each other the same, we love each other very differently because we have these different kinds of embodied metaphorical conceptions of it. So. Um, and I think you know, many of us can go back and forth between these different kinds of conceptions to it. But so in that sense, I think there's a lot of flexibility here. So it doesn't mean you have to think of it in one particular way. I, I, I guess one more thing question would be, if, if we could make ourselves really exquisitely good uh, non-metaphorical articulators yes. of, of what we mean, right? Might, might we end up uh, with, with 
a way of, of sort of getting people to take our perspective using language that, that works better than the metaphorical method. I, I guess what you're going to say is no. Right? No, I mean, I mean, partly because, I mean, we can think about that as an abstract kind of experiment, but we're metaphorical beings. I mean, it's like we have no choice in that, in that kind of matter, which is why metaphor is such a pervasive part of so many different domains of experience, linguistic and otherwise. So it's definitely more than yeah. necessary. Yeah, I, yeah. Again, I, you know, it's, you know, there is a bunch of people go, look, okay, there's all these love metaphors and, you know, big deal. There's still some part of love that's, that's non-metaphorical. It's this kind of this literal love. And I always go in response to that, okay, what is that? What is that? And all of these kinds of abstract concepts that we think, oh, there must be some non-metaphorical part to it or essence to it across people, across experiences. And I'm always kind of, okay, well, what is that thing? It seems to me that we're just so fundamentally, because of the bodies that we have and the world that we inhabit and the reciprocal relationship between those things, including the relationship with one another, is these metaphors are just fundamentally an inescapable part of who we are. Yes, please. I'm curious about the um, directionality. It seems like um, in your stuff with the, the walking to the ball, mm -hmm. um, that, that felt a little bit different um, than some of the other like coffee, heat work, and stuff like that, in that um, you actually had to give them the metaphor for them to then right. produce the effect. Right. Um, so I kind of expect, when you set that experiment up, I expected the opposite, that it would just be there. It, with love, we get you know some of this distance journey stuff for free. Um, so I'm curious as to, um, yeah, what you think about it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're getting. I mean, certainly, you know, different kinds of metaphors, verbal metaphors and conceptual metaphors have different spatial movement, physical characteristics to them. Right, so, right. Well, so, so I guess you're trying to make the language and thought argument that with, you know, we think in metaphor constantly, right, and that means that these things are linked to these these basic everyday concepts I, all the time. I think or is it only that when you give someone a metaphor, no. they then get all this other stuff? No, I think, I think it's a, I would say it's a reciprocal kind of thing. I think our, again, <coughs> fundamentally that we get these, you know, these experiences, these, no, these non-linguistic experiences, we move about in the world and we see these patterns. And we feel these kinds of patterns. More is up, things that are big are important. Uh, uh, things that are affectionate tend to have a warmth feeling to them. <laughs> Understanding things is related in some levels to grasping. And I think those non-linguistic embodied, and I also think these are all socially cultural, I, I could talk about that as well, that these things are all done within social cultural contexts at all times. So there's not, here's the body stuff and here's the social cultural stuff. Every one of these embodied activities is inherently cultural in some sense. But these things, again, give rise to concepts for which when we have particular languages at our disposal, it makes sense for us to talk about our experiences in particular kinds of ways. So it's, it's, it's a mo it provides a motivating force for why it is we talk in the particular words and ways that we do and not others. At the same time, I think it is still controversial, but I, I strongly believe that you know, the kinds of metaphors we speak about actually have an effect upon the way that we think. Maybe not in big, dramatic, all versus none kind of ways, but you know, we, when you learn a new language and encounter different kinds of metaphors, I think that can change your views on certain kinds of things. I read certain poems and someone comes up with some creative metaphor or analogy. You know, I, th I now am slightly a different person as a result of that. I think slightly different as a result of that. So on the one hand, these things are motivated from the ground up and the language, we have these metaphorical language that reflects these metaphorical concepts and these metaphorical kinds of experiences. But then the language itself can have a top-down kind of influence to get us to think differently. And maybe even at some times have different kinds of embodied experiences. You know, it's interesting, the emotion, work on emotion shows, for example, that you know, if you wanna, if you're feeling depressed and so forth, stand up straighter. It has this amazing effect. You can put people, you feel better. Smiling, Not, you know, be happy, smile. I used to hate that. It actually it works. If you smile, you have this bodily basis. It, it goes back into it. So it, it's a reciprocal kind of thing. And I, so I see it as this whole kind of system here of the metaphors rising from the bottom up, but the metaphorical language also has an influence on a top down in terms of what our experience is. Yes. Sir. 
I'm very sympathetic to the embodied approach, but I'm troubled by sort of the lack of uh, an individual differences level. So athletes, for instance, with more tools should be better thinking. Sure. Why isn't Oliver Torbett a better physicist than Stephen Hawking? Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, this, this is a really good question. In fact, um, I wrote a book on embodied cognition, and I, I had a little section in there on people who have physical disabilities and do they think differently and um, um, you know it's 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 a tough question we don't have a lot of data on that particularly but it, you know it's still interesting even someone like Stephen Hawking I forget when exactly he he became disabled the way he did but there's some huge portion of experience where that was perfectly normal and so forth and even now was someone in his present condition, there's still source path goal and more is up and uh, uh, happiness is up and bad is down. I mean, there's all those kinds of things that are still very much part of what his bodily experiences are. It, it could be that, you know, people do have slightly different kinds of metaphorical conceptions because of their experiences being finely attuned in some physical domain. I think that's a tremendous, interesting possibility. Containment. Men versus women, do they, because they have different kinds of bodies, different kinds of containment experiences, might that be? These, these, these effects might be very small, and only, only a small percentage it might have in terms of the total variance, but that still might be you know, important. So I'm open to that possibility. Um, um, but but I, I, st I still think that in a lot of cases, people who are alive and living in the world have a lot of different kinds of fundamental experiences that serve as the foundations for you know, these kind of basic... Well, it seems like there must be something mental that people are doing with the equipment rather than simply having more or less of the Sure, yeah, sure, yeah, I mean, there's something, you know... That ends up being the mental... <laughs> I wouldn't want to call that strictly <laughs> mental. See, I think one of the things that I think is important about the kind of perspective that I'm trying to argue here is that a lot of times when people say, well, these metaphorical languages came into being from embodied experience, but at some point it becomes abstracted away from experience. Um, the great Swiss psychologist, developmental psychologist Jean Piaget was a strong believer in intelligence being grounded in sensory motor experience. But he was of the belief that at a certain age, you know, when you hit 12 or 11 or so forth, those things become individuated, separated. And under the perspective I'm suggesting, it's continually linked to embodied stuff. So the fact that you are continually engaged in you know, taking journeys and being upright and so forth has a continual effect upon the nature of the concepts that you are continually creating in each individual situation in your life slightly differently. So I, I, I'm happy to acknowledge possible little minor effects from different kinds of physical experiences that people have. Different cultures have different kinds of environments. Those things all may have effects that I think that's possible to, to study if you do it the right way, study the right way. Yes? Um, if, uh, if they can do uh, research uh, identifying your neurons, mm -hmm. and just observing something, um, is there any research suggesting, for example, that when one is presented with a, um, a movement, a travel metaphor mm -hmm. about something, that um, uh, 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 movement muscles, that there should be a correlation as if, you know, if someone talks about grasping the concept, can they find neurons related to this behavior? Um, I, actually, I don't know the answer to that, but certainly to the extent to which when you hear a verb like kick, the extent to which you are engaged in pre, uh, mirror neuron actions if you are doing something somewhat related to kicking, suggest that that correspondence might be there. But I don't know in terms of if they've done it specifically in terms of metaphor. Do you, by any chance, do you know anything, if Larry, does anybody? Um, the, the work that I know that I was thinking about is um, people have been working on dance. Oh, yeah. And the two kinds yeah. of things that are happening is that um, dancers, when they hear music that they know how to dance to, their motor cortex gets active. But the other interesting thing is that uh, in one study, they took dancers and had them look either at movements that were within their, right. their repertoire or movements that were very similar but not in their repertoire. And again, the activation of the motor cortex, as I recall, is different yeah. in, those, in those particular cases. So it's actually relatively specific in that sense. In other words, yes. a dancer who knows about all these different kinds of movements, 
nonetheless, there's a specificity to the knowledge that they yes. that they have. Yes. So even if they're seeing something different uh, that, that's related, but is not part of their own repertoire, their motor uh, cortex is not active in the same fashion. This this goes a little back to your question, if I may. Um, I also know the related stuff in terms of mental imagery, that people are able to do mental imagery. There are things that are more consistent with things that their body can do. And that's related to people who are studying that in terms of athletic performance and so forth. So, um, so I think that's that kind of stuff that Larry refers to, I think is consistent with the story, generally. There's yes? A, oh, no, I was just going to add one other thing, which is this um, odd thing, too. It goes with your point, I believe, with this embodied aspect of things, which is David McNeil and the people who've been studying the gesture of accompanying language. One bit of evidence that they have is that congenitally blind people will gesture. Mm -hmm. So that these are people who have not seen other people gesturing, and yet they will be using their body as part of communication. And so this is just part of the large issue that you can't sort of tease out these embodied things in, in, a, in a sort of straightforward way because apparently humans have these deeply interconnected right. in some way or another, such that even people, again, that are congenitally blind will be activating their body as they're speaking in the same way that sighted people do. Yes. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. So my question is about the uh, tennis ball experiment, which yes. is fascinating. Uh, and I'm with you, and obviously metaphorical language is more vivid and more engaging, and stuff. the beginning of this would disagree with that. But there's something a little bit paradoxical about uh, the experiment in the following sense. So you said that uh, there was no discernible difference on the average of the pace at which people were walking. Yes. It. So the difference well, was in the, the, the number of seconds that they walked. Yes. So if I remember rightly, the, the people who, who saw the, the, the non-metaphorical language, they they tended to walk for the same amount of time, I think it was around 12 seconds, right? So what I see there is that those people, uh, regardless of whether the story was successful or unsuccessful, right. they all thought that they could reach the goal within 12 seconds. In other words, they had a more optimistic sense of their ability to get to the tennis ball in a certain amount of time. They thought they were walking faster than they were. Mm -hmm. They're covering more distance yeah. in that yeah. time. So they, they have, in some sense, an accelerated sensation of where they were going relative to what they were actually doing, because they fell short. The, uh, the ones who had the, uh, the, the successful story with the graphic lines right. uh, actually uh, underestimated how far they had to go, because they, in fact, so they thought the ball was further away than it actually was, because they walked longer. Well, the, another, OK. I, I, I'm, um, but does that mean that there's uh, I want you to two? Yeah, I, I, the, uh, one again. I think that's a possible alternative explanation. It's kind of in psychology we would say psychology. This is what psychologists love to do. I don't know if anybody here is a psychologist. Psychologists love to take really interesting ideas and say no, no, no. It's just this something very. And I think you've kind of done that. Kind of just no, no, no. You don't need all that. It's just X. It's like something silly and. No, I'm trying to translate to the embodied sensation right, of time. Right, right, right. But I, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure how to respond, but let me just say one thing. One is that one of the things I didn't do, and this is what I should possibly do in the future, is to videotape these things. So I think what's going on, at least in the successful versus unsuccessful metaphorical, is that the, the unsuccessful ones, they start and then they, as they're thinking about the story, they slow down. Right, so it isn't they all walk the same constant pace. So there's a, there's a ch uh, change of pace that's going on there that might be indications of how they're running the simulation across time. So that would be interesting to kind of do um, and see if I can find that kind of difference. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, um, I, you know, this, I, I don't know how, how I would control for that task demand the other thing that's related to this is to, to find a way of doing it so that people are walking while they're hearing the story. But, it, 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 but then there's the kind of once the story's over, they'll just stop as opposed to thinking about the, the nature of the story. So I, I'm not sure how I control, control for that. And I think what you're suggesting is something has to be perhaps controlled for if I can think of a way of taking your, your uh, paradoxical suggestion and turning into something that I can test. Please. Well, I was wondering about the use of the concept of journey. Yes. Well, I guess you probably understand 
or where I'm going. Um, I, I think or sure. quite often the metaphorical menu start to find is sort of over over engineered. The yeah. journey is so many different things. Yes. What what really interested me about that some of the experiments you were doing was the correlation between let's say directionality and pace. Right. That's cool. Yes. Uh, I really like the idea that it's not just motion right. uh, in the right. direction, but also the speed of motion. Right. So the, the moment I, I see more than one dimension of yes. the of engagement, yes. that gets really interesting. But is there a way for us to think about metaphors without labeling domains in ways that are so overly... General? Yeah. Like, so it is just journeys? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I so... This is, first of all, an issue of, of methodological debate within conceptual metaphor theory. What is the right level to specify the nature of a conceptual metaphor, right? And so I, I don't, th when, I, when I use the term love relationship to journey, that's, you know, that's just a, a term that I think there are people that I'm using descriptively to convey some idea. I think what people are typically are doing, they're not going, okay, I'm doing this journey now, but I think they are, you know, the language that cognitive linguists use, they may be engaged in some kind of image schematic process of doing source path goal, but each context will be slightly different in some way. And so they're creating it. It isn't like they're activating, okay, love relationship is journey, here we go. But rather they're kind of running this, creating this, this imaginary situation of themselves doing some movement along some path towards some kind of goal. And that will be different in particular kinds of cases. Um, there's some interesting work that I, that people are doing in corpus linguistics, looking at how people's interactions with uh, artifacts affects the nature of, say, the journeys they take. So we talk about a path to happiness, or a road to happiness, or a way to happiness. Which which one of those seems best to use? And you see, you can do these corpus analysis of how often people talk about roads, paths, and ways. And then you can do this independent stuff of having talk about people's experiences of what, what happens with roads versus paths versus ways. And people have different experience of those three different things. And it turns out that it maps very consistently, not entirely, but it maps quite, quite precisely with your, your experience with working with artifacts in the real world gets mapped into how you talk about you know, whether you're going to say the road to you know, proving this theorem or the path to this theorem or the way to this theorem. It gets very, the, the mappings can get kind of precise depending upon the specificity of your kind of folk intuitions are about these, your interactions with these artifacts. So I think this is also um, relevant in the sense that when people are, are, are doing metaphorical thinking, they're doing it in the context of a real world with physical stuff and cultural, that have cultural values to it, and that all informs the kinds of conceptual metaphors you have and the kinds of simulations you run. So is it the case then that marriages go awry because you actually end up on the wrong metaphors? <laughs> uh, no, actually this is one of the things, I listen, I'm a big fan of, of metaphor therapy. It has never worked in my marriages, but I didn't have met. <laughs> no, I think no. I think it's really true. You look at people and they're talking about their relationships, and it's sometimes it's just clearly obvious that they're just taught thinking about their relationships in different kinds of ways. Because right, I have some serious findings, which is related okay. more to what Larry is talking about in the problem of mapping. Mm -hmm. I mean, mapping is something that we tend probably statistically to get wrong most of the time. Mm -hmm. There are few instances where we don't. So the map isn't the territory we can understand that, but really one of the few places we don't get it wrong is with the menu in the restaurant. We know we can't eat the damn menu. It, yeah. it represents the fair, but it's not the fair. Right. But we do get it wrong all sorts of other places. And you're saying that in the sort of accretion of a continual linkage to the real world, yeah. of building these metaphorical structures, they imply a certain progression and a certain change Right. of reality of view, right. yes. and yet it doesn't seem necessarily, it doesn't seem to be social. No, I think it's, I actually disagree with that. I think you find 20 years into a marriage that where you, you thought we were both going on a journey, <laughs> turns out that actually you were on an island. <laughs> and, no, I mean, I guess yes, I understand that. Yeah. But it, it is interesting that they can be not communicated yes. what the basic frame I understand, is. yes, yes. 
But two, two comments. One is that I think, first of all, again, I, I really do fundamentally believe that people have multiple metaphorical conceptions of things. So if I were to ask you in detail about the nature of your marriage, I almost guarantee you'll be flipping back and forth about different aspects oh, no. of the marriage to different kinds of metaphors. So it isn't like you walk around, marriage is a journey, another person marriage is a building, and that's it. Um, so I think these multiple metaphors come in and out at different times in the course of a single conversation and may have different salience in different times of your life. So then and sometimes they match and they're coupling with someone else who you're in a relationship with and sometimes there's points of co outright conflict because of the discrepancy of the nature of your so marriage. That brings us back to Jim Enns' question earlier about what else is going on which gives this a kind of, um, if you will, a, a process continuity across the discontinuities. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, most of our experiences of some, I mean, psychology, human cognition, life is really this kind of intricate balance between stability and variability. And, and typically what we focus on in, in doing psychology and cognitive science, we want to find the regularities and stabilities in experience. But most of our life is, in, is, in, is the in-between, is the indeterminacy. It's in the cases where things are highly variable. And I won't try and describe this today, but one of the things that I've been thinking about and writing about over the recent years is trying to look at more things in terms of processes of self-organization and dynamical systems theory, which I think is a kind of way of thinking about experience that is much more sensitive to these kind of lovely interplay between stabilities and variabilities that doesn't just think, clunk, we're doing this, and then there's some noise, and clunk, we're doing something, and then there's some noise, but it's all dynamical kinds of noises. It's a lot of our experience, including metaphorical, is in the in-between spots. Yeah. Just as yes. a quick point of curiosity, you mentioned people leaning forward when yes. talk about to do Chinese yes. back and talk about the past. Do Chinese speakers stand up kind of on their tiptoes when talking about the past? I don't know. Do you know yeah. There is some work, interesting, there is some work by psychologist Lara Boroditsky, who's done some stuff with Mandarin speakers and conceptions of time. And she has found some evidence to suggest that they can, particularly for bilingual speakers, switch. When they're speaking Mandarin, they can do the more vertical. There's other people who have come back and say, haven't been able to replicate that work. So that work is very contentious and controversial. But some people have been trying to do some things along the line you're kind of suggesting. But we don't, I'm sure we don't know the answer, but that's, that one area in particular seems to be controversial. Yeah, yes. Oh, just filling in, um, just uh, some of the work that I've done in metaphor, it's very common in, in Western uh, tradition, the characterization of music, you've got high pitches and low pitches, uh -huh. but it, that's actually was something that developed in the Middle Ages, and if you go back before that time, that's not how pitch relationships were characterized, and if you go to Bali and Java, that's not how pitch relationships were characterized. Right. So there's actually cultural ways that that's, that that's shaped, and then it turns out that those are related to musical practice in a very rich way. So part of the answer to the question is, is that I think people leaning forward or leaning back, it really depends upon what they're drawing from. Because I think one of the things is that actually, I believe it was in ancient, uh, it, among, in ancient Greek, the past is actually, um, or, or the, the past is ahead of you, and the future is behind you, or something, you know, it's, and so it's just kind of around. And so, if what you're talking about is the case, there would still be an embodied reaction to that, but it would map successfully onto the metaphor, right? And so that, so the thing is, is that it, it isn't that the future is really in front of us. Right. It's right. simply that's the structure that's right. that we have for understanding. That's right. You're actually getting right because the music work on the Lenish Amara. Amara, yeah. Right. Found the exact. Right. Look at the verse. Right. Yeah. Right. No, what you're talking about, and it was discovered because of gesture. Right. Right. I, sh I should say here, yeah, I, I should say, by the way, there's plenty of, speaking of love relationships and journeys, you know, don't get too linear about this. There's plenty of cultures, they're going in circles and yeah. stuff. And but to me, that's like, we're in circles here. We got to break up. I mean, it's a bum people. That's the way it's supposed to be. So. <laughs> okay. So another question. I'm sorry. Um, can you, can you explain, like, when some people give some speeches, they uh, shake back and forth, like, what do you shaking? Does it have any... Shaking back and forth? Yes. Rocking? Like, you know, when people, when people talk, you know, they rock, send their toes, this way. Oh, they do this, yeah. <laughs> Does it have any explanation? No, psychological explanation. 
Uh, except, except for the possibility, it's sort of like, you know, Hamlet, to be or not to be. You're trying to find an equilibrium in some way, and you're like trying to make, you're trying to stay, up, stay up, upright, and that's a way of maintaining balance. I don't know. Okay, I'm just, just winging it. Yeah. More about the small uh, question. Because children, little uh, kids, they have like better motivation, so supposedly they have better like, image schemas that brought up to them. Does it mean that they are more inclined to understand that course? I'm not sure what you mean if, they, if children have better imaginations. So, you need to give some uh, new metaphor to them. But do you think it will be better for children? Like, easier for children to understand new metaphors? Well, certainly there's work, and I've done some of this, that shows that children's understanding of metaphors greatly facilitates to the extent to which it relies on things that are conceptually metaphorical and related to their embodied experiences. Those metaphors that are related to those foundations are things that kids learn faster or earlier than ones that have more opaque, less transparent kinds of motivations. So there's evidence to so that's the case. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.